Hello, everyone. Thank you to those of you here at the St. Thomas Aquinas Church and uh, everyone joining us online. My name is Peter Copeland, and I'll be moderating this evening's events. It's a great privilege for me to be here on behalf of the St. Monica's Institute for Lay Formation and Catholic Conscience, Canada's uh, Voice of the Heart for Catholic Social Teaching and Civic Evangelization, both led by Matt Marquardt. We are co-sponsors of this event, along with Father Mark Kolosovsky and his wonderful team, uh, Marie and, and Rochelle and, and many others at the Newman Center here who really make this uh, come together. So it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Rod Dreher, or as I recently learned, Raymond Oliver Dreher, Rod in acronym form. Mr. Dreher is a world-renowned American writer and editor. He's a senior editor at the American Conservative and author of several New York Times best-selling books, including How Dante Can Save Your Life, The Benedict Option, and Live Not By Lies. Tonight, Rod will take us through the argument of his latest book, Live Not By Lies, which will be followed by an interview-style Q&A with myself and uh, the audience. So Rod made the trip up from his home in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and uh, he was really hoping for a fall weather reprieve from the hot weather down there, and it looks like he brought the fall uh, with us. So um, without further ado, I'd like to, everyone to give a warm Toronto welcome to Rod Dreher. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Peter. I, I have to say, though, that you, the name is not Raymond. This is what Wikipedia says. It's Raymond. It's Ray. Never trust Wikipedia, friends. Um, it's great to be in Toronto, and right next to Massey Hall, I'm a huge Robertson Davies fan, and I understand that that was where, that was his lair, that was his, uh, his hangout here in his city, so what a treat. And I haven't been to this city since the Toronto Film Festival in the late 90s. I used to be a film critic at the New York Post, and uh, Toronto was the biggest event of the film year for us, even, I think, bigger than Sundance. So. I've changed a lot since I was last here, and so has Toronto, it seems. But um, let me start by saying that I have good news and bad news for you all tonight. The bad news is that if you choose to remain faithful to the teachings of Christ in the Catholic Church, you're going to spend the rest of your life suffering and being persecuted as witnesses to the truth. But that's also the good news. Let me explain. In the West today, we are living in a post-Christian civilization. There are still Christians here, of course. Presumably all of you are. I'm a Christian. But our civilization as a whole no longer looks to the Christian faith to tell us who we are and what we're supposed to do. In fact, the world increasingly considers Christianity to be what's wrong with the world. And more and more, this world is not neutral towards Orthodox Christianity, by which I mean smaller Orthodox, traditional Christianity. Uh, a Christianity that refuses to be compromised and conform itself to the lies of modernity. The church has been here before. It was born into a pre-Christian world, obviously, the world of the Roman Empire. It had to minister to a small flock that was hated by Rome, uh, and the Roman Empire made many martyrs. Thanks to the twin totalitarianisms of Nazism and Communism, the 20th century saw more martyrs and confessors made for the Christian faith than at any time in its history. But while we Christians in the West grew comfortable with the faith, men and women in other parts of the world suffered and died for Christ, and it's still happening today. In Nigeria, in China, and in much of the Muslim world, I was talking with Cardinal Collins, and he was telling me that so much of the church here in Toronto is, in fact, made up of refugees from this persecution abroad. You don't hear a lot about this in our media, at least not in the United States. You ever wonder why that is? As someone who has been working as a professional journalist for over 30 years, I can tell you. The media today sees its role not as telling the truth, but rather as managing an ideological narrative. Under this narrative, Christians can only ever be persecutors, never the persecuted. I was talking in Europe earlier this year with a man who works at a very high level for the uh, persecuted church, 
And he was telling me that there is no way to get diplomats and other officials from Western governments to take the persecution of Christians seriously in the Middle East or anywhere else because of this narrative. Well, under communism, Christians and all others who ran afoul of the ruling ideology were sent to gulags or to prison. The gulags, as you know, were vast prison camps where enemies of the state, so-called, were detained and punished for their dissent. This is what communist totalitarianism meant for all who dared to think for themselves and to stand for the truth. So when I tell people that we are starting to live under totalitarianism today, they think I'm crazy. So where are the gulags, they ask? And that's a reasonable question. I got the idea for writing this book, Live Not By Lives, a few years ago when I got a call from a doctor at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, he told me that his elderly mother, who lived with him and his wife, had come to America as a young woman escaping communism in her native Czechoslovakia. She had spent six years in a prison as a, quote, Vatican spy. That was what the communist government charged her with when she refused to stop going to prayer meetings at her church. Uh, she came to this country, she married, he, the doctor, was born here, and she lived a life in freedom and comfort and of achievement. I think she was a doctor herself. But this doctor called me up because he said, my mom told me recently, son, the things I see happening in America today remind me of how things were when communism first came to our, my country, my home country. And the doctor was really rattled, I could tell. And um, he said, I just wanted to tell somebody. And he knew somebody who knew me, and so that was that. Well, I thought that was probably a little bit nutty. I mean, my mother is old. She watches a lot of cable news. She gets afraid of things. So uh, I began to check with people uh, whenever I would travel uh, to conferences or go abroad. If I would meet somebody who had come to the West to get out of the Soviet bloc, I would ask them, are the things you're happening now, does it remind you of what you left behind? Every single one of them said yes. And if you talk to them long enough, they would talk about how angry they were that people in the West don't believe them and don't see what they're saying. Well, what were they seeing? Uh, we're living under what I call, from talking to them, soft totalitarianism. That is a totalitarianism where increasingly you can't say what you think, you can't do some things that you really want to do, things that were perfectly normal just five minutes ago, because you're gonna run afoul of the ruling ideology in our, in our society. Nobody has guns to force you to conform, but they have their ways. I think we don't see this as totalitarian because our idea of totalitarianism was formed by the experience of the Cold War and the Soviet Union, and by Orwell's famous novel, 1984. In the Soviet Union and in Orwell's novel, totalitarianism is as hard as hard gets. The state enforced its ideology through violence and terror. Well, we don't have that now, so how can we call this totalitarianism? It's a reasonable question. Well, first we have to ask, what is totalitarianism? It is a form of government that emerged in the early 20th century. The word, in fact, was coined by Benito Mussolini, the fascist dictator of Italy. He said a totalitarian state is when every aspect of life is contained within the state. That is, everything in life is politicized. Under authoritarianism, that's a political system in which all political authority resides within one figure or one party. But totalitarianism is an extreme form of authoritarianism. It is authoritarianism that spreads to all parts of society. There's no part of society that is not politicized. I'll give you a real life example. In 1924, in the early years of Russia's Bolshevik Revolution, the Soviet Chess Society objected to the government trying to interfere in its affairs, trying to politicize the game of chess. It put out a statement saying that chess ought to be played for the sake of chess, not politicized. Well, the government sent them a letter correcting them, saying, comrades, after the revolution, all things must be done for the sake of the revolution. Nothing can exist outside of this political consciousness. Well, we're living increasingly under a similar state of affairs with the cultural politics of wokeness. If you don't believe that this is totalitarian or has totalitarian aspects, ask yourself, how free are you 
to dissent from the various dogmas promulgated by institutional authorities? Could you publicly dissent from gender ideology, from racialist ideology? If we were still a liberal society, you could, because you would have a right to be wrong. In a proper liberal society, we believe in free speech, we believe in an exchange of ideas, we believe people have a right to be mistaken. But we don't live in that society anymore, so you really can't, not without potentially paying a very high price. Well, this is a, a, an emerging form of totalitarianism that has a lot more to do with Aldous Huxley's dystopian novel, Brave New World, than with Orwell's 1984. It's about a totalitarianism of therapy and comfort. In the early 2000s, Rene Girard, a, one of the 20th century's great intellectuals, uh, wrote a piece about the power of victimhood. Uh, this is a big part of his mimetic theory. He was at Stanford when he wrote all this. But he, he could see what was coming, and he said, we approach a point where victimhood is being weaponized to become a totalitarian form of command and control. Gerard said this over 20 years ago, and he, he died a few years ago. He didn't live to see it come to its fruition, but we are well on, on the way for that. Um, a few years ago, a Hungarian Catholic friend who was a young wife and mom told me that she didn't understand her friends in Budapest, even her Catholic ones. She told me that if she told them that she and her husband had been arguing lately, that they would cut her off and tell her, oh, get a divorce, go back to work, you deserve to be happy. She told me, I say to them, but I am happy. I love my husband. A happy life doesn't mean a life without problems. But Rod, they don't understand what I'm trying to tell them. I told her, Anna, it sounds like you're fighting for your right to be unhappy. She said, yeah, that's it. Where did you get that? I pulled my phone out and went to chapter 17 of Brave New World, Aldous Huxley's novel from, I think it was 1931. The dissident in that dystopic world that, uh, that Huxley created is named John the Savage. And John the Savage is brought in to see Mustafa Mond, the world controller for Europe. The world controller doesn't want to torture the savage to make him conform. Rather, the world controller wants to know why on earth the savage won't voluntarily join their society. Because the savage has been raised in a reservation educated only by the complete works of Shakespeare. He hasn't participated in this society where they give you, where all your needs are taken care of, they give you all the happy pills you want, they give you pornography, they give you lots of free sex, they give you entertainment, everything is taken care of. Um, they're, and they're constantly, constantly distracted by entertainment. So they never have to think about God or anything else, anything that would trouble their conscience. The world controller calls this state of affairs, quote, Christianity without tears. Says the savage, quote, what you need is something with tears for a change. Nothing cost enough here. The savage means that that's the problem with this utopia, that there's no suffering. Without suffering, there's no humanity, and nothing is real. The controller says, no, 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 no. We prefer to do things comfortably here. The savage says, but I don't want comfort. I want God. I want poetry. I want real danger. I want freedom. I want goodness. I want sin. Well, in fact, says the controller, you're claiming the right to be unhappy. All right, then, said the savage, I'm claiming the right to be unhappy. The controller just shrugs his shoulders and says, you're welcome. I'm telling you tonight that we are living in a soft totalitarianism that is fast approaching the world of Brave New World. We are oppressed by our own appetites, and we are oppressed by experts who wish to create a world in which no one ever has to have an anxious thought or feel threatened by anything. This safe space of perfect justice will only be possible by destroying freedom, by destroying art, by destroying religion, and all the things that cannot be perfectly controlled, and by driving all of those who dissent to the margins of society. This is where we are today, in Canada, in the US, and all over the West. It's, it's gotten far along, and it's got a lot farther to go if we don't stop it. We have been catechized by the culture to prefer comfort and happiness to all things, even the truth. In fact, a well-known sociologist at the University of Notre Dame says that the de facto religion of our time is something he calls moralistic 
therapeutic deism, MTD. This is common, he says, in all forms of Christianity and even in non-Christian religions in our consumeristic, hedonistic society. It is a pseudo-religion that works parasitically on true faith. The tenets of MTD are simple. One, God exists. Two, the main goal in life is to be happy and to feel good about yourself. Three, God wants us to be nice to other people. Four, you don't really have to be involved with God except when you have a problem. And five, only really bad people like Hitler go to hell, but the rest of us go to heaven. Well, if that sounds familiar to you, that's no surprise. This is what most people who identify as religious believers believe. It's how I was raised. It's what I thought Christianity was for much of my life until I got to be a teenager and realized that this is middle-class not therapeutic nonsense. And only later, when I went to the cathedral at Chartres, maybe we can talk about that later tonight, and I was confronted with a, a, a manifestation of the true God, the God of history, the God of, of church history, that I, only then did I realize that there was a lot more to Christianity than I, I had been taught. But um, any of, MTD has very little to do with real Christianity. In fact, it's the brave new world version of Christianity. It's Christianity without tears. Now, if this is what you believe, then I, will, I want you to consider that it's a vaccination against accepting the true faith. That's because you can only really know Jesus Christ if you're prepared to suffer. This is the way. Everything else is a lie. I know that because it's how I lived before I became a Christian. When I was the age of college students, I wanted to be a Christian, but I refused completely to, to die completely to myself. I was willing to believe in the easy things about Christianity, and as for the rest, I wanted to negotiate with God. To be specific, I wanted God to leave me alone to run my sex life like I wanted to as a red-blooded American male of the late 20th century. But that doesn't work. God is a jealous God who demands that we have no other gods before him. I wanted Jesus for psychological comfort. I didn't want him to be my Lord. It was only when I had made such a mess of my life, trying to run it on my own, and only when I got to the point that I wanted Christ more than I wanted myself, and I was willing to sacrifice my own desires to follow him, that was the point when I was really prepared for conversion. Dying to self is not easy. It's not supposed to be. But that's the only way to truly live. It is the only way to live in truth. That is to say, it is the only way to live not by lies. So what are the lies we're asked to live by today? Well, I think the main one is that achieving a state of happiness, which is defined as no worries, is the central goal of life. Another one is that truth is only what we decide truth is. We have my truth and your truth and her truth, but not truth. That's a lie. There are many more lies, lies about human nature, lies about the meaning of our bodies and the meaning of maleness and femaleness, and lies about the meaning of justice. In your heart of hearts, you know that you're being lied to by the people who are in charge of our society. And if you think about it, you will also know that these people depend on keeping us all constantly distracted, looking at our phones, having our attention drawn here, there, and everywhere, so we can be controlled. Maybe you want to live by lies. Maybe you prefer moralistic therapeutic deism to real Christianity. Maybe you want to conform to what the world wants. If so, I can't help. In this time and in this place, to follow Jesus faithfully is going to require suffering. It's going to require being consciously countercultural. You may lose friends. You may lose your job. You may have your bank accounts cleaned out by your government. You might even lose your freedom. If, if our governments institute a social credit system along the lines of what they're doing in China, and I think this is coming, we will find ourselves unable to participate at all in society as the cost of living in truth. But if you choose the path of truth, if you choose the path of following Christ in truth, what do you gain? Well, you gain your soul, the most precious thing any of us have. Aside from that, though, you show to yourself and to the world that there is something greater than material well-being. I think about one of the great heroes of my own country of the 20th century, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. He showed by his willingness to suffer and to suffer uh, by not fighting, uh, not fighting back against the cruelty and violence done to him, 
he showed that there were some things higher than the body itself. And in so doing, he ultimately converted a nation to his vision. Uh, under communist totalitarianism, the dissident Czech playwright Václav Havel asked his readers in the 1970s to imagine that there is a greengrocer who, like every other shopkeeper in this communist city, has a sign in his window that reads, workers of the world unite, the Marxist slogan. The shopkeeper doesn't believe it, none of these shopkeepers do, but they keep the signs up in their windows to avoid trouble. So what happens, said Havel, if the shopkeeper, the greengrocer, takes down the sign? Well, the secret police come and they arrest him. They take away his business. They force him to be a street sweeper. His family suffers. There is a real price to pay. But what, aside from dignity, has the greengrocer gained? Well, he has shown the world that it is possible to defy this lying system and to live in truth if you're prepared to suffer for it. And this will be a sign to everybody else in society who is sick of the lies. Eventually, if enough people decide they're sick of the lies, the tyranny built on a structure of falsehood will itself fall. In fact, that happened in Czechoslovakia in 1989. And Václav Havel, that writer, that playwright, who was once thrown into prison for, his sake of witness, for the sake of witnessing to the truth, became the first president of a free Czechoslovakia. You Christians here, all of you, all of us, are called to be Havel's greengrocer in our time. We're all called to be savages in the brave new world sense. It is the only noble and truthful way to live, and it's the only authentically Christian way to live. But how are we going to manage to do this in an era of widespread confusion? Well, it's going to fall to the young generation, the college generation, to lead the way as it has before. I have two stories for you. Around the year 500, a young Catholic man came down to the city of Rome from the provinces to finish his education. He found Rome to be a total mess. The empire had fallen uh, 20, about 24, 25 years earlier. The city was governed by barbarians. He quickly realized that if he stayed there, he was going to lose his faith. So this young man, his name was Benedict, retreated to a cave in the side of a cliff overlooking a steep valley not far from Rome. For three years, he stayed in that cave and prayed and fasted and read scripture, asking God to tell him what to do. When he came out of that cave, Benedict had written a rule for how to live in a vowed Christian community. By the time he died in the year 547, Benedict had founded 12 or 13 monasteries outside of Rome. That's not bad, but if that was all he did, we would barely remember him. However, the rule of St. Benedict and the way of life Benedict prescribed became wildly popular. Over the next few centuries in Western Europe, thousands of young men and women committed themselves to a life of communal um, living together in common in Benedictine convents and monasteries. These were lives of real austerity and in fact real danger in the lawless early Middle Ages. But in time, uh, those monks and those nuns laid the, the groundwork for the rebirth of civilization. And as you know, the Benedictine order is still with us today. Most of us are not called to be monks or nuns, but all of us are called as Christians to live lives of spiritual order, spiritual discipline, especially disciplining one's attention, and community, all focused around for God. These faithful Christians built monasteries and convents that served as beacons of light and of hope in the chaotic dark ages. It's going to have to be the same with all of us. As a young priest, the future Pope Benedict XVI, I call him the second Benedict of my book, The Benedict Option, prophesied that the church would lose most of its wealth, most of its power, most of its status, and be reduced to a faithful remnant. But the ardent faith of that remnant, tried by persecution, would illuminate and warm a world grown cold and dark. I ask you young people here tonight to consider that you and your generation are called to become that remnant and to draw others to yourself and to Christ. I certainly hope the church doesn't suffer more than it's suffering now, but the signs don't look good. Even if you, with the, the church continues on like it is today, 
you're going to be called within the structure of the church itself, and all of us are, to be that kind of faithful remnant. This is at the core of what I call the Benedict Option. It's not about heading for the hills, whatever you might have heard, but rather it's about going deep, deep into the faith, much deeper than most in your parents' and grandparents' generation have done, to recover the living tradition that the church saved for us and protected for us over so many generations from the very beginning. It's all there. We just have to claim it for ourselves. It's that we have to uh, be about living countercultural lives in community here in the world for the sake of Jesus Christ and for the sake of the world so we can show the authentic face of the living Christ to a world that desperately needs to see it. Second, we have to prepare ourselves for persecution. I did not know about this man named Father Tomislav Kolakovic until I went to Slovakia, the first stop in doing my research in the former communist world of Central Europe in 2019. Father Kolakovic, I ended up dedicating Live Not By Lies to his memory. Father Kolakovic was a Croatian Jesuit who was doing anti-Nazi work in Zagreb. In 1943, he got a tip that the Gestapo was coming after him, so he sneaked out of the city and went to Bratislava in his mother's home country of Slovakia and adopted her last name, Kolakovic, to hide out from Germans. He began to teach in the Catholic University there. And he told his students right away, he said, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is the Germans are going to lose this war. The bad news is the Soviets are going to be ruling this country when it's over. And the first thing they're going to do is come after the church. We have to get ready. So what Father Kolakovic did was bring together groups of young people, young Catholics, for prayer, for study and discussion, and to plan action. He implemented a, a, a method that he had taken from a Belgian priest called Joseph Cardine called See, Judge, Act. What that meant was when they would come together for prayer and discussion, they would talk about what they were seeing around them, and the judge uh, aspect of it was to talk, to analyze and to say, what are, how do we understand what's happening in light of the faith? What should we do about it? And then to act was to go out into the world and to execute the decisions that they had made together. Within two years of coming to Slovakia, Father Kolakovic's groups had spread all around that country. You had see, judge, act, prayer groups all around the country. And uh, they were learning practical things too, like for example, how to survive an interrogation without uh, giving up your, your, your comrades. Now, the bishops of Slovakia didn't like this one bit. They told him, Father, you have to stop this. You're scaring people. You're being an alarmist. It's never going to happen here. But Father Kolakovic knew it was going to happen because when he was studying for the priesthood in Rome, he uh, studied in particular the communist system because he wanted to be a missionary to the Soviet Union. So he kept up his work. Sure enough, when the Iron Curtain fell over Czechoslovakia, everything happened exactly like Father Kolakovic predicted. The communists rounded up the lay people and the priests who were collaborating with Kolakovic and put them in prison. But after they got out of prison, they, they went out to evangelize the country and they strengthened the underground church. This is why the underground church in Slovakia was one of the strongest in the communist world, because that far-sighted priest came to the country, told them what was going to happen, and told them, don't just sit passively waiting for it to wash over us. Let's get ready now. I firmly believe that we are in a Kolakovic moment now in the West. Um, the, uh, there are people of my generation and older, I'm 55, a lot of us have too much, too much vested in the idea that everything is basically going to be okay, let's just stay quiet and stay the course. But if it had not been in Slovakia for that student generation of idealistic young Catholic students, the underground church in Slovakia might not have made it. I think the similar, there's a similar possibility this could happen in Canada and the United States and in European countries. Finally, I want to tell you um, about a young man who's not much older than college students here tonight, who learned by surprise how valuable it is to suffer for Christ. I met him in Slovakia when I was researching my book, Live Not By Lies, there. His name is Timo Kriška, and he is a professional photographer. Now, Timo's grandfather knew what it was like to suffer under hard totalitarianism. His grandfather was a Greek Catholic priest, you know, Greek Catholics can have wives, who was forced out of the priesthood by the communist government. 
Well, a few years ago, in order to honor the memory of his grandfather who suffered for Christ and the truth, Timo traveled around his country interviewing elderly Catholics who had served time in prison and been tortured in some cases under communism because they would not deny Jesus Christ. Timo, a photographer, wanted to take photographs, do formal portraits of them, and he got some text by doing interviews with them for a book. Well, Timo found these people uh, living simple lives. Some of them were still living in poverty, and they all recalled the opportunities they had to suffer for Jesus when they were young to have been among the greatest blessings of their lives. This young photographer, Timo, was staggered by the inner peace radiating from the faces of these old confessors of the faith. Timo told me, quote, it seemed that the less they were able to change the world around them, the stronger they had become. These people completely changed my understanding of freedom. My project changed from looking for victims to finding heroes. I stopped building a monument to an unjust past, and I began to look for a message for us, the free Unquote. The message Timo found was this. The secular, liberal, materialistic idea of freedom so popular in the West today is a lie. That is, the concept that real freedom is found by liberating the self from all binding commitments to God, to marriage, to family, to anything that, that restricts our desire, and by increasing our worldly comforts, that is a road that leads to hell. Timo saw that in his country today, in post-communist Slovakia, the only force in society standing in the middle of that wide road yelling stop was old-fashioned Orthodox Catholicism. Who would have thought it? And then it hit him. Timo told me, speaking of his generation, the first one raised after communism, quote, with our eyes fixed intently on the West, that is material uh, prosperity, we could see how we were beginning to experience the same things we knew from the time of totalitarianism. Once again, we're all being told that Christian values stand in the way of people having a better life, a happier life. History has already shown us how far this kind of thinking can go. We also know what to do now in terms of making life decisions." Unquote. Timo also told me that he finally understood why even though he had way more money and way more freedom than his parents' and grandparents' generation, he couldn't escape the anxiety that he needed to get more and more, that he was falling behind, he had to work harder and, and to strive more to get more money in the bank. Timo said to me, quote, accepting suffering is the beginning of our liberation. Suffering can be the source of great strength. It gives us the power to resist. It is a gift from God that invites us to be changed to start a revolution against the oppression. For me, meeting these hidden heroes started a revolution against the greatest totalitarian ruler of all, myself. Now, does that sound crazy to you? It might. A college professor a few years back told me that he stopped teaching Brave New World because none of his students recognized it as a dystopia. They thought it sounded pretty great. And I know that from, for some people here tonight, my words might sound bizarre and even despairing. Now, so where is the hope from this guy coming here from Louisiana to tell us that times are going to get worse and that Christians need to be prepared to suffer and be fine with it? Well, my response to that is that for Christians, hope is not the same thing as optimism. The optimist believes that everything is inevitably going to get better. Now, the Christian hopes things will get better. He doesn't want to seek out pain and suffering, but he is not compelled by Christ to believe that things will always get better. Rather, Christian hope consists of the certain conviction that even if things don't get better in the short run, that as long as we unite our suffering to Christ, that our suffering has ultimate meaning. Let me tell you a story that's in Live Not By Lies that is probably the most meaningful one that I got in all, from all the dissidents I interviewed. Um, it's from a man called Alexander Ogorodnikov. Ogorodnikov is, an, uh, is a Russian. He's in his 70s now, but he became a real sensation in early 1970s Moscow because he came from a, a very high-level communist family, but he found communism to be empty when he was in his early 20s and converted to Christianity. He began to hold prayer meetings in his apartment in Moscow. He couldn't get priests to talk to him because they were all being, being followed by the KGB. 
but he had young believers who were seeking Jesus to come over to his house to pray, to talk, and to sing hymns. They all knew they were being watched by the KGB and that they would all eventually be arrested, and they were. Uh, Alexander, though he was not given a death sentence, they still put him on death row to make an example of him with the worst people, worst criminals in all of Russia. When he got there, he got busy witnessing to them, spreading the gospel, evangelizing them, and he began to convert prisoners to Christ. Um, the wardens got so mad, they moved him to solitary confinement. And it was there in solitary confinement when he was having to live by himself in squalor and being beaten. In fact, his face is still partially paralyzed from the beatings he took then, that he began to despair of God. One night, he told me, and he was sitting there in the Metropole Hotel in Moscow telling me this, this luxury hotel, this man talking about this utter despair. And he was kind of scared, too, because I, as my translator told me later, the Metropole was known as a KGB nest back in the day. But he had come there to meet me, and he told me this story. He said one night he was awakened by an angel, a literal angel, awakened him and showed him a vision. In the vision, two prison guards were leading a prisoner with his hands tied, uh, cuffed behind his back. Alexander could only see them from the rear, and they were leading him to his execution. Alexander couldn't quite understand what was happening, but this kept happening over and over, night after night, he would see a different person. Finally, he realized that he was being shown men to whom he had witnessed and who had come to Christ because of his witness and who were going to be executed. These are convicted murderers, after all, but who were going to be with par in paradise with the Lord because Alexander had been there to share the gospel with him. And Alexander then, when he realized that, he, all of his faith came back to him because he knew that there was meaning in his suffering, that the Lord called him to be there for that purpose, that there were a number of souls who were going to be saved from the fires of hell because Alexander Ogorodnikov was sent into the hell of that KGB dungeon for their sake. That's the sort of hope, that's the sort of thing that is real Christian hope, that there is meaning in suffering. And Ogorodnikov cries about it today, about what that, what that all meant to him. He went on to tell me about how they finally put him in a, a, a distant prison, um, uh, a jail. He was the only inmate there out in the country, and an old prison guard came to him at night. This was a pensioner who didn't have anything to do, so they said, go sit there and watch this Ogorodnikov overnight. Prison guard came to Ogorodnikov's cell, banging on it one night, and said, help me, help me. They come at night. Ogorodnikov said, what are you talking about? He says, they come at night. Who is they? The man told about how when he was younger in the 1950s, in the time of Stalin, Stalin's last years, uh, he had been witness to the KGB taking 50 Orthodox priests out into a clearing in the woods at night, lining them up in two lines, one behind the other. The KGB chief went to the first one in the line, put a pistol to his head and said, do you renounce Christ? The priest said, I do not renounce him. KGB guy pulled the trigger, blew his brains out. They splattered all over the face of the priest behind him. KGB guy goes to the second priest, same question, same response. He shoots him. That KGB guy went to each prisoner, slowly, methodically, asked them, do you renounce Christ? Not one of those priests renounced Christ. Now this old prison guard, from that day forward, he remembered the faces of those priests as they faced their martyrdom and bravely accepted it. And it haunted him to the end of his days. And again, Ogorodnikov is telling me this, crying. And I'm thinking, I'm an American sitting here. We've been so blessed to have had nothing like that in my country. But here is a man who has seen this and who has lived it, whose country has suffered horribly from this kind of persecution. We had better, in our comfortable, free Western lives, start paying attention to the stories of these men and women, and not just from the Soviet bloc. Since the book came out, I've heard from people who have come here, Christians from China, from Cuba, from Venezuela, seeking freedom, who have similar stories to tell. Well, let me end tonight with this prayer recorded by witnesses to the martyrdom of Bishop Polycarp in the second century. This prayer is from the earliest account of Christian martyrdom we have out of the New Testament. As he was bound and put onto a pile of wood, to be burned to death, the 86-year-old Bishop of Izmir, Smyrna, and disciple of St. John prayed this prayer aloud. The witnesses recorded this. O Lord God Almighty, the Father of your beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, by whom we have received the knowledge of you. 
the God of angels, powers, and every creature, and of all the righteous who live before you, I give you thanks that you count me worthy to be numbered among your martyrs, sharing the cup of Christ and the resurrection to eternal life, both of soul and body through the immortality of the Holy Spirit. May I be received this day as an acceptable sacrifice as you, the true God, have predestined, revealed to me, and now fulfilled. I praise you for all these things. I bless you and glorify you, along with the everlasting Jesus Christ, your beloved Son. To you, with him, through the Holy Ghost, be glory now and forever. Amen. Then the Romans lit the fire and they burned him to death. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the mystery of Christianity. Through the eyes of Polycarp, to suffer and die for Jesus was gain. He placed the search for holiness above the search for happiness and was given both. That was good news for Polycarp, and it's the good news for us if we have eyes clear enough to see and hearts stout enough to say, yes, Lord, I will follow you, come what may. Thank you very much. Say something happy, Peter. Say something. Yeah, well, we know now that happiness comes through suffering and struggle, so not right away, not right away. <laughs> Just bring the chairs up here and um, go into a, a Q&A, and we'll be, um, if, you, if you have access to technology, there's a link you can pose questions to Rod, and I'll uh, look at those myself and, um, and pose them as we go along. So there's one chair. Could you get to take a seat, Rod? You know, I have to say that uh, one thing when people meet me face-to-face, -face, they often say, oh, I'm, you're actually happier than I thought. You seem so dour on your <laughs> blog and all that. I th I, the secret is I come from South Louisiana. We're the people who, when a hurricane is coming, everybody gets very serious, you batten down the hatches and get ready, and then when you've prepared everything, you fire up the gumbo pot, you ice down the beer, you call your friends over, and you have a hurricane party. So. There we go. Wonderful. Well, you've, you've painted um, a very vivid picture for us of both um, you know, the, the diagnosis of the ills facing us and also um, the hope uh, mm -hmm. in, in the community, um, that, that deepened community, not out of the world, but very much in it. Uh, it it's kind of funny, your, your, your hopeful message, which is often not maybe the way um, Christians are known for writing, uh, came before um, your, your most recent book, Live Not By Lies, but um, we'll, we'll talk about both tonight. Um, I'd like to start with um, really delving deeper into your argument the argument by analogy and the slippery, slippery slope in Live Not By Lies. And then I want to ask you about how we ought to live uh, as Christians in today's culture. Kind of a, a qualitative question. Sure. And, um, you know, there's that lovely line that's, that's said of the first Christians, see how they loved one another. But yet, you know, Christ um, is as demanding and yet consoling. So it's, what does that really mean, right? Um, and then lastly, uh, about Christian politics. How ought we engage in the political life uh, today as Christians? Well, so, thanks for coming, everybody. I'm going to slip out on that one. <laughs> no, a lot for you. Yeah. <laughs> it's a difficult question. So, um, can I start? Yeah, yeah I'll start, start with start, one start. here. So, let's start with uh, Live Not By Lies. Um, as I've said, there's this undertone of argument by analogy um, that we're on a slippery slope to something akin to uh, totalitarianism, and you're using examples from uh, the Soviet Union and also mm. other places around the world. But we're not headed to a hard totalitarianism. We're, we're headed to a soft form of it, uh, you argue. So, um, you know, as with all arguments, the, the strength of analogy is, is all important to its validity and, and persuasiveness. Um, so how did you arrive at the, the conclusion um, that we are headed this this way in, in kind of a you know a really rigorous um, sense, and are there any counterexamples of countries or cultures that have gone down this path but have then uh, you know stopped short of of descent in, into that? Yeah. Well, um, at first, uh, as I mentioned in the in the talk, just talking, meeting people who came from these countries, and sitting there and listening to them and not dismissing them right away. I say, ah, come on, you know, and asking them to explain more. And a lot of times they were older people who didn't, who couldn't put together a 
you know, a, a PowerPoint presentation, but they would just talk about how they feel it in their bones, and it would always go back to, um, we're not allowed to say what we think. In fact, the woman um, who, the, the Czech woman, the old Czech woman, what prompted her to tell her son this, and he, him call me, was she saw on TV, this was uh, uh, something that happened in the state of Indiana, conservative American Midwestern state. Uh, just before she told him that, she had watched the state pass a, a very mild law called the, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It was a state version of a federal law that passed in, 19, um, in 1993. All it would have done would, was to give people uh, an affirmative defense in court if they're sued for discrimination. Uh, they could say, well, that we're following our religious views. It wouldn't guarantee by any means that they would win, but it would give them a little more, e even things up. Well, a lot of states in America passed that over the years. Well, the state of Indiana decided in 2014 to do the same thing. And uh, they didn't think there would be any problem. Well, big business came down like a ton of bricks on the state of Indiana and told them, if you go through with this bigot law, we will boycott you, we will punish you. That was the first time big business had ever d taken sides in the culture war in that kind of way in America. Plus, and this was the thing that triggered the woman, the old woman, the media in Indianapolis, the capital of the state, went to a little town in the far northwestern corner of the state. They found an evangelical-owned pizza parlor named Memories Pizza, uh, owned by a family. And they interviewed the father and his adult daughter who ran it. And they said, it's a pizza parlor in a little town. Would you serve gay customers? They said, of course. Yeah, why not? Well, would you cater a gay wedding? Said, no, that would be going too far. That would be against our religious beliefs. There you have it, people. They won't cater a gay wedding. This set off a media mob nationally. Do you remember this? And um, they, the family had to go into hiding. There was somebody who went on Twitter and called for everybody come to this town to burn down Memories Pizza. This is the thing that triggered the old Czech lady. She said this is exactly what the communists did when they were consolidating power. They would gen up a mob by saying that this business owner was a counter-revolutionary. So that was the sort of thing that made me start thinking. And then when I went to Slovakia, I, there was a Slovak priest who said, you know, this is hard for us to define too. We know what's coming. He said, in, in some ways, this is more difficult than communism because under communism, the gospel shone a clear light through the darkness. But under this, the light of the gospel just hits fog. Yeah, well, and this really speaks to your definition of totalitarianism, which is that it's totalizing. Yeah. And there's not a corner of society or an institution who isn't uh, threatened by and feels as though it needs to toe the line, so to speak. Um, so I wanna probe deeper into some of the reasons there. How does the, the liberal culture of self-expression and consumerism feed into this mix? On the one hand, it seems like a, a crucial differentiator from other regimes, like the Soviet Union, one that guards against the possibility of a genuine hard totalitarianism. So, you know, people are comfortable so long as there's choice, you know, line up for food, and they can, you know, express themselves through consumerism and travel, things of that nature. Doesn't really matter if, you know, we're, we're increasingly uh, working all the time yeah. and off, and hour, off hours, you know, we're in the rat race. <coughs> We don't really have deep forms of community. You know, th things are safe. People are, are choosing, they're expressing themselves. Um, so, so what do you make of that characterization? Is, is this a significant bulwark against um, further degeneration? Because people, they get upset when the choices are taken away, if anything. Yeah, I, I, I think that people have been catechized, as I said, and to believe that maximum, maximal choice is the best possible society. But a, a liberal society, liberal in the sense that we're all liberals, both on the li right-wing liberals, left-wing liberals, is one that doesn't want to take a stand on what should be chosen. You can't actually live that way. There was a, a tweet, if you're on Twitter, you've probably seen this, it went viral by Larry Summers, a former Clinton, I think he was a Treasury Secretary, former president of Harvard, uh, one of the top economists in the US. He put a tweet out saying, isn't it strange that we are seeing so many people dropping out of the workforce, even though they're able-bodied, they're living, they're dying deaths of despair, et cetera. Somebody should study this. <laughs> yeah, it's happening because people need a reason to live. And I think that the, the proliferation of, of hedonistic uh, delights, 
you know, with legalization of marijuana, for example, with widespread pornography and things like that, these have all been distractions that have helped people cope with the, the sense of a loss of meaning. But at some point, it's not gonna be enough. Um, I was just at a conference in Florida uh, last week, and I talked to people from Europe, economists, I talked to a government leader and uh, people from finance, all of them say that we can look forward to uh, hype, global hyperinflation within the next six to 12 months because of the energy crisis in Europe. And nobody's really talking about that. You take away people's toys, you take away their drugs, you make people have to suddenly worry about heating the house and feeding their families, and you're gonna see the real price to be pay that we're paying for having given ourselves over to all these pleasures and being dictated to by our appetites. Yeah, we, we may indeed, we'll see. Um, I wanna ask you about some of the um, causes of, you mentioned wokeness, but there are also you know, petulant forms of this kind of radical ideology mm -hmm. on, on other parts of the political spectrum. Um, someone like Mary Eberstadt, who actually spoke recently at the Newman Center here, has pointed out the correlation between family and community breakdown, divorce mm -hmm. rates, single parenthood, and declines in religious attendance with this ideological fervor for the rabid form of mm -hmm. social justice ideology. And it's, you know, it's an obsessive search for identity and belonging in, a, in an outsider and meaning, and non, yeah. and meaning exactly, and not in these outsider and nonconformist identity groups. You know, it says, much like the, the Catholic tradition, that the, the love and support of the natural family and community, um, without that, people are much more susceptible to this mm -hmm. sort of thing. What do you make of that theory? Is it, is it A or perhaps the factor underlying all of this? Yeah, I, I think it is one of the chief factors, and Mary's book is brilliant talking about that. Um, when I was researching my book, I read a, a great book from 1953 by Czesław Miłosz. He's a Polish uh, poet and intellectual who had been part of the communist government in early communist Poland, but then defected. He came to the West and wrote this book called The Captive Mind. And in it, he tried to explain why intellectuals fell for communist totalitarianism. And one thing he said really struck, uh, really stayed with me. He, he said that people in the West have this idea that people could only believe in communism because they were forced to. He said, that's not really true. He said, communism is a form of idealism that speaks to deep longings within the human soul for belonging, as you said, for belonging, for identity, for meaning, for purpose. And, uh, and that's why a lot of people coming out of uh, World War II were drawn to it. They were looking for a form of idealism and they didn't go for, for the older forms, for religion. They couldn't believe in religion anymore. There's a book I, I, I read and I quote from it in Live Not By Lies, I forget the name of the woman. She was a Jewish, a Czech Jew who had escaped from one of the German concentration camps at the end of the war. She came back to Prague and became a communist. She said it wasn't because she suddenly accepted Marxism-Leninism. She just wanted to, to join up with whoever was the farthest away from the Nazis, and they gave her a sense of hope. The communists offered a hopeful vision. Well, she married a man who was a communist, and within a few years, he was put on a show trial, and she learned what communism was really all about. What was so important about that, her testimony, though, is to say that there's a reason people go for the, these, these frightful ideologies. In a similar way, I think Mary is right, that so many young people raised in this post-Christian society uh, are desperate for a sense of purpose, for of meaning, uh, and of uh, a sense of solidarity. Hannah Arendt, the great philosopher, political theorist, and philosopher of totalitarianism in the 20th century, said in her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism, that the single most important factor that predicts whether a country will succumb to totalitarianism is mass atomization and loneliness. Nothing was even close to that. She, she had studied Bolshevik Russia and Nazi Germany to figure out why did those countries surrender. There were a number of factors, she said, but that was the most important one. And when you're sitting there reading this book that came out in 1951 where she's talking about this and realizing that in the United States, we look back to the 50s as the golden years, the time of 
you know, when nobody bowls alone, everybody's coming together. Arik was seeing it happen, starting to emerge in North America then. Well, now when you read uh, polls showing that Generation Z, the most connected generation in history, is also the most lonely. In the United States two years ago, there was a, an insurance company that did a loneliness um, uh, research on the different generations. And they expected to find the elderly to be, would be the loneliest because of the different conditions, material conditions, that often attend growing older. It wasn't the case. It was Generation Z. Seven in 10 of Generation Z described themselves as lonely. That, as uh, Aaron would say, is fertile ground for totalitarianism. So we shouldn't be surprised that they are going for wokeness. One, mm -hmm. one last point I want to make. I was at a conference in Budapest earlier this year. The political uh, scientist, Eric Kaufman, who's at uh, Berkeley College in London, he addressed this by uh, video because he had COVID. He said that this was a group of conservatives, academics, and he said that conservatives had better start fighting the culture war above anything else. Why? Because his research into the political beliefs in the United States of Generation Z showed that they had, a, a, a healthy majority of them had no respect for freedom of religion, no respect for freedom of speech, and all the typical liberal freedoms that we take for granted. They see these things as harmful. Hmm, interesting. So you, you allude to this term, and I think you know, many of us feel it today, walking on eggshells. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think you know, it's fair to say it is a common human experience felt by those that are not the in-group in any culture or civilization to a certain extent. And, you know, who's in and who's out changes over time. And I, I have a close friend who, who disagrees uh, with my pessimism, if you could call it pessimism, about the state of our, our culture. And, and he likens the current um, uh, progressive cancel culture as analogous to the McCarthyist Red Scare days in the mid-20th century. Yeah, but we were all taught that was a bad thing. McCarthyism is a bad thing. So, you know, this idea that, oh, well, now you're just getting what your ancestors doled out to us. How is that justice? V very Sorry, fair. You no, finish no. your question. <laughs> Sorry. Absolutely. No, no. And I, no, I, I hear don't that think... all the time, though. Yeah, yeah. But I guess the, the, the point is, you know, it's past, and as our culture has become increasingly socially libertarian and secular since then, then, you know, the views of those with more religious, wholesome communitarian views. They, they have the target against their backs and mm -hmm. humans are, are sinful and, you know, I, I don't, is, it, is it a precursor of, of totalitarianism? What, what makes today's situation different? I, I, I think because the people who are now in, in charge see that they have, or they believe they have moral warrant to go after people like us to achieve some bizarre sense of social justice. Like what you said, well, the, the right persecuted the left back then, so it's only just deserts. Or Christians persecuted gays, or whites persecuted blacks. And like, I thought the point of liberalism, the good thing about liberalism, was that we come to a point where we treat each people as an individual, judge people by what Martin Luther King said, the content of their character, not the color of their skin. But this new idea of social justice uh, sees the line between good and evil running between economic groups or racial groups or uh, political groups, not as Solzhenitsyn discovered at the Gulag. Solzhenitsyn, his most famous saying from the Gulag Archipelago was that he discovered the line between good and evil runs right down the middle of every human heart. That's profoundly Christian, right? We're all sinners in need of redemption and repentance in need of mercy, and so therefore we give mercy to others. But this new ideology, it promises people power, and it promises them a sense that if they, if they get that ring of power, that they'll use it for the good. But it never works out that way. It's always used against them, you know? Once we disconnect ourselves from a sense of truth, or truth becomes, and justice becomes a matter of power relations, and only that, then we're gonna create hell on earth. And that's what I think we're in the process of doing now. But yeah. telling ourselves, oh no, no, we're just settling moral accounts. Yeah, it's, it, I, I do think there is a, a sense of um, the means, you know, justify any end uh, yeah. today for, for sure. Um, I wanna move to the, the second theme now. Um, 
how ought we live as Christians today? And, you know, when people think of the God of love, what do you think they imagine love to be? On the one hand, we see, you know, excessive sentimentality, <coughs> that's false compassion, and a mere desire to avoid conflict. And on the other extreme, we find rigid adherence to rules, right thinking, and an overly critical attitude. And some might criticize your approach as too critical in, in this, this uh, spectrum of things. But on, on the other hand, you know, a prophecy, as, as you've said tonight, is, is a, a difficult thing. And Christ um, is both uh, inviting and persuading and demanding. He's, he's maximally consoling and also, you know, demands everything of you. And that's, that may be what love is. So what, what kind of impression do you think you give on, on non-Christians and on people who don't share your views? And who do you think, how ought we live as, as Christians today? Gosh. Well, I, I'm sure that I, I don't make, I hope I'm wrong, but I probably don't make a good impression on people who think that love is giving people whatever they want, yes. giving them whatever they want to feel good about themselves and their situation. I rather believe in the older definition uh, that love is wanting the best for someone, which is not necessarily what they want. And I think about my own situation after I converted, uh, after I became a Christian in my mid-20s, the big, as I alluded to in my talk, the big thing I had to do was to be chased. That was the big thing I had to overcome, the way I had to die to myself. And I got no help from the church, none. I, uh, the priests seemed embarrassed to hear my confessions. They, I, I was, the fact that I was trying to live by the teachings of the church and struggling seemed to be really unmodern to them and, and to be uh, uh, difficult. I, I wanted their help. I needed their help. I didn't get it. I still knew the right way to live, and I knew that I did not want to go back to that Egypt from which Christ had delivered me. But um, it was not loving at all to me to tell me that my uh, desire to be chaste in obedience to Christ and the church was wrong. And that's the sort of... Uh, I, I think about my own dad, too. My dad, who died a few years ago, he was a very moral man, but he was also tender. You know, and we, my sister and I, wanted so badly to win his approval with our behavior because, not because we were afraid of him, but because there was something about him that we knew he was morally strong and he wanted what was best for us. Now, I ended up, when I became a teenager, we clashed over certain things, as often happens, but in the end, when I think about my late father and the way he raised us, that's what I would like to see the church be, and that's how I think people should be, you know, morally strong but also compassionate. When I think of, of a good model for that, I think of John Paul II, frankly. You know, that when I was, he was one of the reasons I was attracted to Christianity in college. Um, he came to New Orleans in 1987. I wasn't a Catholic and not really a Christian, but I wanted to go see him at the Superdome. There was something about him that I was so drawn to. I thought, this is a man who is not afraid. He's not afraid to stand against a modern world but he's not an angry prophet shaking his fist. That's the sort of person that I would be too tempted to be. Rather, he found a way, John Paul did, to stand strong in the truth of Christ and in, uh, for the church's teaching, but to do it in a way of compassion. And that is something that I think we should strive for. And I don't, I, I, Rene Girard, I mentioned him earlier, he's uh, well known for his mimetic theory. He said that we learn how to behave by imitating other people. The Christian learns how to behave by imitating Jesus Christ. But the Christian also learns how to behave by imitating holy men and women, like John Paul. Yeah, it's, it's such an amazing example, and we see it in the saints. And, um, but it is so very hard for us, is it not? Yes, to live these, and it's just a, just a comment, really, but I think it speaks to why ideologies are so, so tempting. Well, here's, let me say this, too, about love. Um, I wrote a book called How Dante Can Save Your Life about how the Lord sent the divine comedy of all things to me in the middle of the journey of my life when I was in a terrible crisis. I was, I had, because of a fracture in my family between me and my mom and dad and my sister's kids, I fell into a deep depression and got chronic illness, chronic mononucleosis for three years. When I was struggling with that, I was reading the Commedia and also going to confession to my priest and doing a lot of intense prayer. 
my priest asked me one day in confession, because I'd always confess anger. He said, what do you want? And I said, I want them, to tr them, my mom and dad, to treat me fairly, to treat me justly. He said, what does justice have to do with love? I said, well, if they loved me, they would treat me justly. He said, well, maybe so. They're loving you imperfectly, but you have to still love them as Christ loves you because you don't give Christ what you should, but he loves you anyway. Try your best to love them anyway. And I didn't want to do that, but I did it out of obedience, and I did it because I knew that's what Jesus asked of me. And do you know that I gritted my teeth and kept going to see my parents and all that? Thank God for it because I was there for the day when my dad, just a few months before he died, told me that he was sorry for the way he had treated me. And I never thought I would live to see, hear him say that. He was a very proud man, very proud. Um, he said to me, he grabbed me by the arm when he was sitting in his rocking chair, he had tears in his eyes, and he said, he started to stammer. He said, I, 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 I was talking to the Lord last night for a long time, a, a, about my transgressions against you. That word transgressions, that he had to use the biggest word he could. And, and, and I, I told him I, I was sorry, and I think he heard me. I said, that's the closest I'm gonna get to hearing my dad say he's sorry. I said, he did hear you. And I kissed my dad on the cheek and drove off. And I thought if I had known what was waiting for me when I moved back to Louisiana, I never would have done it, but I did it out of love for my family. And I had been healed deep down from this alienation I'd felt from God the Father because of my own confused relationship to my dad, but I'd also been there to hear my dad say I, he was sorry. A few months later, my dad went into home hospice and died with me holding his hand. And I'd always thought that that was going to be the worst day of my life, the day my dad died. In fact, when I got married, I told my wife, the day my dad dies, you're going to have to pick me up. I'll be shattered into a million pieces. But there he was dying right in front of me. And it was golden. It was so harmonious and beautiful. That night when I got back to my house, I'd been living with my dad for eight days and ministering to him, uh, through his, helping him through his final days. I thought, why am I not crying? Why is everything at peace? Why do I have this peace that passes all understanding? And uh, I realized that it was because I followed what my priest told me to do, to force yourself to love your dad, to show love to your dad, even though you're not getting back what you think is just. And because that's God's will. And then I thought about the line from Dante's Paradiso where the nun uh, Picarda says to Dante, in his will is our peace. In God's will is our peace. And I found that peace because I loved against my own will. I put God's will above my own because my priest told me to and Dante told me to. And that was why I was given this great gift of being able to die holding my dad's hand and to be in total peace with him. So that's what I mean by love, you know? And it's not about emotions. Emotions are part of it, but sometimes we have to go against our emotions to show real love. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing story. And it is very much the case, I think, that you know, we've, we've gotta keep faking it until we make it. And it is that, that great relief, actually, that comes from dying to your own will that you see when you, when you follow the Lord, but, but it is so very difficult. Um, one final question before we get to the audience Q and A, uh, Rod. Um, much has been made of the fact that Christianity has been weaponized in the past and perhaps presently for political gain, and is even made into a political program. On the one hand, there's a clear abuse of the message of the gospel when the faith is being used this way for worldly ends and ideologies, but on the other, a clear scriptural call, one one affirmed by the church's tradition down the ages that we are called to live our faith in an integrated way and to make our politics and social life reflect the message of the gospel. So in your view, what is the best way to think about Christian politics or politics infused with Christian message? Does it fit into a particular program, belief system, or ideology? Oh boy, that's such an important question. I mean, most people know, if you know my writing, you know I'm a conservative, but I'm not, I'm a registered independent in the United States because Neither the Republican nor the Democratic Party fully expresses what I believe in. <clears throat> I tend to be more left on my economics and more right on my social beliefs. But I don't have the choice when I vote in my country for the perfect candidate. I have to choose between the lesser of two evils and the evil of two lessers. And I feel like right now in my country, 
there is a pretty clear choice. We have the, the liberal party that is totally pro-abortion, totally pro-gender ideology, uh, working against the freedom of religion, especially in fact for Catholic hospitals, things like that. And um, it just, it, it's, it's scary to me. And I, I, for me, religious liberty is the most important value in the hierarchy of values. It's not the only value, but it's the most important value. And so I, I, vote, I tend to vote on religious liberty and life issues above all others. But that's not to say that I think that either party has any monopoly at all on Christian virtue. I would say this too, that we've seen in, in the United States in the Trump years, uh, a number of people, especially uh, white evangelicals, came to see Trump as some sort of savior figure. And that was really disturbing to me, um, even though I completely understand voting for Donald Trump, but to see any kind of worldly figure, political figure, as a messianic type is really dangerous. And I think we saw, I mean, I'm 55 years old, and my, in my lifetime, we've seen the rise of the religious right in the United States, and I guess I would be on the religious right because I'm on the right and I'm religious, but um, so many religious conservatives thought that if we just vote for the right politicians, everything's gonna work out. Get the right judges on the bench and everything will be fine. Well, it, did, it, was, it was a false hope, you know, because the culture itself changed radically while so many religious leaders, again, especially among evangelicals, were fighting for the Republican Party. The culture was changing right out from under them and they were losing their own kids. With that in mind, I, I think that one of the most important things we can do is practice um, a, a kind of a politics that this man, Václav Benda, he was a Catholic, one of the only Catholics inside the inner circle of Václav Havel, the, the leader of the um, Czech opposition, he said that when you live in a society when you can't have any political influence, then that doesn't allow you to become a quietist, just stay outside of it, don't dirty your hands. He said we have to expand our view of politics. We have to realize that politics in the deepest sense is about working for the common good. If you can't get involved, in, if, if you're not allowed because of a totalitarian government or whatever from getting involved in you know, standard politics, then get involved in some way to help your community out. There are so many things you can do uh, of your own initiative to help strengthen your community. One thing uh, the Bendas did, Václav Benda and his wife Camilla, they would have picnics just to remind people that we're a community here because the communist government depended on keeping everybody isolated and afraid of each other in order to control them. What Václav Benda did was just have a picnic. Don't lecture them about anything. Just bring everybody out of their house to see each other and realize we're neighbors here. Uh, that sort of, I think he called it apolitical politics or non-political politics. That is a form of doing politics that all of us Christians, whether we live in a liberal polity, conservative polity, wherever, can do and must do to rebuild a sense of community. And that is a way to fight totalitarianism too. If it is true, as Hannah Arendt said, that totalitarianism feeds on the alienation and the fear that we all have of each other. If we get face to face among each other, it's harder to hate people. You know, mm -hmm. I, I notice it happens all the time when, um, when I'm, I go out and give speeches and people meet me, as I said, they're often surprised that I'm a nice guy and I'm often surprised by them if they've been really nasty to me online. They change completely when we meet face to face. <laughs> it's true. And it's a great thing and it helps yeah. me realize how I get so caught up in online, like I'll tell you, I'll come up with a withering bon mot to, uh, <laughs> to eviscerate you yeah. and that's just un inhuman. And, it's true. Yeah. and I'm guilty of it as well as anybody else. Yeah, it's so easy when all the the guards, you know, the normal things that keep us from saying things are, are not there online. I'm going to fire a couple at you at a time here, Rod, so we can get to some audience questions. So Thomas asks, do you have any advice on how to know when it's time to speak up and when it is more prudent to stay silent when confronted with this pressure yeah. to conform? And the second one, Christianity teaches counting trials as pure joy. However, the theme of blessedness, happiness, is also taught through the Bible. How would you define biblical happiness? How is it different than joy? Gosh. Easy question. You know, I, I'm not a theologian, or, or, so I don't, I don't quite know. I, when I think of joy, I think of something that is the highest form of blessedness, the highest form of worship. 
as something that takes you out of yourself. And I think of happiness as something a little more quotidian, right? Um, uh, my friend Anna, the, the Hungarian, she and her husband were arguing those days, but she was happy, you know? She wasn't joyful, she was happy. Um, and that's, happiness is a good thing, but joy is something that is, we experience it on Easter, we experience it when, you know, when our kids get married, things like that. I just think of it as something higher, but I, I wish I could give a theologically astute answer, but that's not me. The, the question that Thomas asked was really a difficult one about when do you know? I wish there were a formula. I, when I was in Poland doing research for the book, I sat down with two men in early middle age. They worked for the Polish branch of an either American or European multinational. And they were being compelled to participate in pride celebrations within the, the company. And they said, look, you know, we're Catholics. We, we were happy to work with our gay co-workers. We have no problem there, but we can't be feel our, in our conscience that we have to affirm because that's going too far. What should we do? And I told them, I said, guys, you know, I, I don't know what I, to tell you because here I am, an American who's flown in here to talk to you guys, and I can fly right back to my safe job in the United States where my family won't be put on the street because of what I tell you, but yours might. I said, all I can tell you is talk to your priest, pray about it, and talk to friends whose wisdom you respect, and certainly, of course, talk to your spouse because you might have to pay that price. We have to be prudent. Um, mm -hmm. We can't just die, you know, fall on our sword at the first opportunity, but if we lean too much on prudence, then we'll end up excusing things yeah. that we shouldn't excuse. So uh, I don't think there's a clear formula for it, but um, only make sure you pray all the time and talk to those who are wise. I love the movie, uh, a Hidden Life by Terence Malick. Did you see that? About I've not yet. No. It's worth seeing. It's about the blessed Franz Jägerstater, who's you know up for canonization. He was an Austrian farmer, who um, Catholic farmer in a small Catholic village. Everybody went to church. When the Nazis came around, Franz and his wife were the only ones who didn't conform, didn't join the Nazi party, and the people in the village are really angry at him. Like, why won't you do this? You know, we're all Catholics here and all that, but Franz had lived in such a way before the coming of Nazism to where his conscience was clear. He could not do that. And he died a martyr in Nazi prisons because he would not swear allegiance to Hitler as a Catholic. And uh, I, I think that there's a powerful lesson there for us. We all have to live in times of peace when we're not threatened, live in such a way that our conscience is constantly being formed, constantly being refined, so that when we're, the question is put to us, what should I do here, it'll be easier for us to know. Two final questions, Rod. Um, any practical advice for a young family with teenage, preteen kids to create intentional community to withstand this soft totalitarianism in our culture? And the second one, one of the linchpins of Benedict's rule is that one must treat every guest as Christ. Mm -hmm. Yet the idea of hospitality seems to be missing from your understanding of intentional Christian living. Can you elaborate? Okay, well, the first question about advice for preteens is get rid of the smartphone, whatever you do. Good Lord, I, the stories I hear from people. I was in Slo uh, Slovenia last summer, and a, a man talked to me, a Catholic father. He was my translator. He said that he and his wife were going through hell with their 12-year-old daughter. He said, we gave her a smartphone. She was 11. All the kids in her classes has smartphones. Why not? She quickly made contact, stumbled across these two older teenagers in the U.S. in Oregon, and they started planting gender, gender fears in her head, said, you've got to choose your gender identity and all that. This girl fell into a deep hole of depression, won't eat, won't go to school, they didn't know what to do, and they thought they were so, they said, it can't happen to us. Here we are, a nice Catholic family living in the Balkans, but it did happen to them. I hear these kind of stories all the time. Limit strongly their participation online, but try to find other kids from other families uh, to embed them in. And this is a very difficult thing in this day and age. When I was growing up in the 70s, you could trust parents because there were so many fewer, uh, fewer opportunities 
that's not right, so many fewer. There were fewer opportunities to get into trouble. And now, uh, I, my, I have an 18-year-old, and he told me that when we first moved to my hometown um, in 2011, he would go over to a, the neighbor's house, and they would watch, like, really inappropriate movies because the mom is really permissive, and, and we thought everything was fine. It's not fine. You've got to find other parents who share the same broad views as you do, especially about technology. I would say technology is the biggest thing. And also, don't just see it as taking something away from the kids. You have to show them something positive. One of the most important things I learned in Live Not My Lies is, came from Camilla Bendova. She was the Catholic mom in Prague. Um, I, they raised five, five or six kids who are now all adults and have kids of their own. They're all practicing Catholics, very devout Catholics, even though the Czech Republic is one of the most atheist countries in Europe. And I asked her how she did that. Well, her husband, the late Václav Benda, would come home and tell the kids what not to do in the world. Like he would debrief the kids when they were coming from the communist schools, and he would just teach them in a gentle, fatherly way how to read the lies in their culture around them. Um, but Camilla knew that it wasn't enough to learn what not to do. You had to learn what was good. So she said every single day, even though she was teaching college, she would read to her kids at night for two, sometimes three hours. I said, what would you read to them? She said, uh, myths. I read to them uh, the classics, literary classics, and I read a lot of Tolkien. I said, oh, why Tolkien? She said, because we knew that Mordor was real. And I realized as she was explaining this, the genius of what that woman had done, because their apartment was where the dissidents came together to meet and to talk about things. She was helping these kids understand that their parents were involved in a fellowship of the ring. They were fighting Mordor. These kids couldn't understand dialectical materialism or anything like that. But they could understand elves and hobbits and dwarves and things like that. So what Camilla did over the many years of all these hours of reading was feed the moral imagination of these kids so that they could on their own determine what was good and what was bad. Not just what was bad, but also what was good and run towards the good and develop a love for the good. That second question about hospitality, I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure where it comes from because um, you know, that hospitality is not a part of the Benedict option. I did write about hospitality that we have to be open to the world. But th what does open to the world mean? Some people think it means that we should never you know, we should be completely indiscriminate about who we associate with, who our kids associate with, and that just can't be the case. The, um, the monks in Norcia told me that they are open to people. People come in all the time to, um, for seeking advice. They come to mass. They, you know, sometimes they just come to hear the singing. But the monks said that we have to draw a line somewhere because if we don't draw that line, then we cannot be for these people what they need us to be when they come, you know? And so you ha there has all these different virtues, Benedictine virtues, hospitality, stability, all of them, they have to be held in te creative tension together. So uh, I would say, for example, that hospitality means for ordinary people that you need to be open to the world, but if somebody is going to come into your family and they are going to, for example, start misleading your kids, teaching them things that are immoral or trying to lead them away from their faith, that's when hospitality has to end. You know, have to, because you have to, in some sense, um, keep order in your own home. Well, we've gone already over so much time. We, I'm sure we could keep talking for, for hours. I, I, this is, be, maybe you can't, but we could sure keep asking you questions, I'm sure. And so I just want to give uh, you know, a big thank you to you on behalf of the Newman Center and the St. Monica's Institute and Catholic Conscience for coming here. Um, you, know, you, you are a, a great witness to, to Christian courage and sincerity in today's day and age. And thank you. Thank you so much well, for your I, time. I thank you, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Um, oh, look, y'all were my tribe. Um, I, I have been so, COVID was so difficult you know, to yeah. be so confined. So I love being able to get out into the world and see people, you know, whether you agree with me or not, just to yeah. see people and to see fellow Christians. It's just, it's awesome. So thank you for coming and thanks for calling me back to Toronto. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks right. everyone.